Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special episode of Stuck in the Middle. Mm -hmm. I'm Sal Hans. AK. Mm. Yeah, today we have a special guest. We had to just snatch her and say, no, you're not going anywhere. So, AK, do us the honors. Man, I don't even know if, I don't even know where to start with this intro, but I'm going to try my best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try my best to make it short, you know, make it entertaining. Um, this lady, she's a perfect example of striving for greatness. When we speak about, you know, dedication, she literally makes sure that everybody, you know, everybody has a goal, everybody is focused, everybody has, you know, some aspect to their life, no matter what, no matter your background, no matter the color of your skin. It is none other than Dr. Estella Atequana. <laughs> when you hear that doctor like that, you know what I mean? Like, we <laughs> have a doctor in the studio. <laughs> that doctor is not just, you know, doctorate degree. This one is, this, there's levels to this one. It's, it's like an onion we about to unpack right yep. now, man. <laughs> first things first, I'm going to call you auntie. Okay, that's, that's what just I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're just landing from Malawi. Yes. So, like, what, 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 brought, what took you to Malawi? Ah, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. I saw I, uh. I had uh, two projects that I was doing in Malawi. And the first part was trying to do geophysical imaging to provide groundwater to a non-governmental organization called Child Legacy International. And they just um, met two wonderful couples that have just spent their entire life dedicated to providing clean water to children in rural Malawi as well as healthcare. So um, they had been drilling several wells without success. Or only they drilled about nine wells, and only three of them were producing water. And so they, um, I was contacted to see if I could use some of my geophysical technology. And uh, it's basically very similar to a CAT scan image. Mm -hmm. And instead of scanning your brain or a different part of your body, you actually scan the earth, yeah. and then you can tell possibly potential areas where there's groundwater. So that's what I spent the first, you know, two weeks doing is doing a lot of imaging and trying to see if I could help them provide clean water. And then the second part is a, a project that I have that is funded by the uh, National Science Foundation is to provide training and capacity building not only to U.S. students, but also to African students. And so every year for the last 15 years or so, I've been taking students to Africa, giving them a taste of what it is like to do research at an international site, but I have a passion for Africa, so I take them to Africa every year. And so that's basically what we're doing, and that's much more science-related, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to understand how the Earth is moving apart, and Africa is the best example, because mm -hmm. we have a more recent example of you know, um, how continents break. So we're trying to answer the fundamental question as to how do continents break before they become big ocean basins. Oh, okay. So the program is a summer program. It's like a study abroad type of... It's kind of like a study abroad, but it's different from study abroad because it's actually hands-on research. So okay. it's not just taking classes. You, The students, the U.S. students, get to um, take the knowledge that they have gained in the classrooms here, and they apply it to a field site in Africa. And we try to engage the students from the local universities so that they could help impart that knowledge onto them as well. Mm. Me, I like going, I like starting from scratch. You know, we got to, you know, <clears throat> most people, most people might be sitting right now listening and, and, and saying, um, what skills, you know, what, uh, what degrees have you had so far to be able to do this? Uh -huh. So, you're a doctor. Yes. It's not an easy thing to go from just, you know, having your regular name and then having to add a doctor to it. Mm -hmm. So please tell us how you got to the doctor part. <laughs> how did they get to the doctor part? It's a funny story, and I always tell people this story, that when you say you're a doctor, the first thing, especially when I go into my physician's office, and I'm like, doctor, the first thing they ask me, oh, you're a physician? I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a real doctor. <laughs> you know, so, and... Uh, my my parents, your grandma and grandpas, always wanted to have doctors, and and typically if you look at look at most uh, 
black families, we feel that there are only three professions. You can be a doctor, uh, a physician, or you can be an engineer, <laughs> right? Or you could be, you can guess the third one, you could be a lawyer. <laughs> and so it's not different from uh, most parents even in Africa. And, and not surprising because when we look at the black community, those are the type of people that we think have been successful and we want our kids to emulate that. And so that's what we always want. And so I really started off by wanting to go to medical school, or my parents wanted me to go to medical school, not me wanting to go to medical school. And like everybody who is a geoscientist will tell you, they take that one class in college, an intro to geology class, and you fall in love with it. And that's what happened to me. Mm. Fell in love with it and was passionate about the science of it. And so I always make the joke that when I actually had my bachelor's degree from Howard University, uh, your grandma thought that I was finishing with a degree in geo uh, degree in medicine. medicine. <laughs> they didn't know <laughs> <laughs> until they got here realized that it wasn't medicine. Very disappointed. So I uh, promised them. I said, you will still get a doctor out of me. And so uh, then that was what inspired me to go on to do a PhD because I still wanted for them to have a doctor in the family. <laughs> wow. wow. Yes. You know, most 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 families always, you know, they always look, f they always want to have a doctor, you know, amongst the kids. Yes. You know, and yes. Back in your era, I, I would jump the gun to say it wasn't something that most people were doing back then. Most people would go, most people would go through um, high school mm -hmm. and be done. Yes. But what really, like, what really pushed you other than just the fact that the family wanted you to be that? Like, in you, what pushed you? Yeah, I think it's, you know, everything, I, I think parents have a, a big role to play in children's lives in trying to shape who they become. And uh, your grandma was an incredible human being. She believed so much in education. Yeah. Her words still affects me to this day. Yes, yeah. she really believed in education, and she really believed that, especially for the uh, uh, African family, especially education for girls, because it was okay to send the boys to school, but it was always like, ah, it's true. am I really, is this a good investment to send my daughter to school? Mm -hmm. But she believed very, very uh, strongly in empowering young women and young girls. And so I really drew my inspiration from her. I don't know if you guys don't know this, but whether or not you know this, but when she gave birth to me, she only had like a, a I think, elementary school education. She just finished standard seven, they say, in those days. Mm -hmm. That's all she had. Wow. You didn't Never know this. But uh, unfortunately, you know, she passed away. You guys all know that. But by the time of her death, I don't know if you guys know this, but she got a master's in public health from Tulane's uh, School of Tropical Medicine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And so she was really, really an inspiration uh, um, for young women. And so I drew a lot of my inspiration, tenacity, you know, motivation from her mm -hmm. and the importance of education. And uh, because she believed that education was a way to unlock the doors so that people can get out of poverty. And she believed in that, and I also believe in that very strongly. Speaking of unlocking doors, mm -hmm. with education, what doors have you been able to unlock? Uh, <laughs> I've been a lot of firsts. <laughs> 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 you know, I've been a lot of firsts in a lot of things that I've done in my life, you know. Um, when I finished my PhD, and so just a little bit, I got my bachelor's degree from Howard University in geology then and a master's degree from the same university as well and then i went to canada and that's where i got my phd and then when i finished my phd i was hired at western michigan university i was the first female faculty to be ever hired by that department and the first black faculty to be hired in that department so that was the first oh, wow. <laughs> a lot of firsts and uh you know i spent 10 years in kalamazoo and then i moved to um, missouri and uh, from Missouri, I was hired at Oklahoma State University, and they hired me as an endowed chair, and I was the first, probably the first black endowed chair to be hired by the university. And if you read my um, bio. my resume and my bio and everything, you know that I became, a, um, in 2011, I think it was 2011, I became a regents professor, and I was the first 
uh, faculty in my department, in the history of my department, to ever become a regents professor. And uh, I was also the first female, and still only the first female faculty in the College of Arts and Sciences to be a regents professor. And uh, in 2015, I got the uh, Eminent Faculty Award, which is the most honorable award at in the on campus or at the university. And I was the first, you know, black faculty to ever get that. And in fact, there have only been two female faculty in the entire history of the award, and I was the second one. Wow. <laughs> yes. Wow, that is big. Lots mm-hmm. of firsts. Lots <laughs> yes, of lots firsts. of firsts. Yes. And you've just been recently, you know, appointed dean of the um, dean of the University of Delaware College yeah. of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. Yes. What, yes. How was that feeling? What was that? I mean, <laughs> how was exciting. it? Yeah, well, it's exciting, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> and I, and of course, there going to be challenges, you know. But I'm always up for challenges. Was that a goal you know? of yours to get to that point? Well. I'm not sure. I I just I think it's not like I ever really planned that I was gonna get into administration. I love research, you know, it's my passion. But I got to a point in my career where I, you know, felt like I needed to give back. And I could continue to be a researcher. But I felt that being research, yes, I can impact the scientific community, but I but I believe that in order for me to make a bigger impact I could only do that from helping others do what I had done. And so that's what, and the only way you could do that in academia is really to get into administration. It's to be able to get in there so you could help shape um, other people. I'm passionate about my students and I'm passionate about uh, the young faculty. And I always tell people that I believe that the students are the future of our nation and the young faculty are the future of the university. And that, you know, university professors are probably one of the most important people in, in, our, com- in our society, but we don't realize that because remember that uh, for a society or a country to continue to be sustainable, you need educated people. Mm-hmm. And it is the professors who provide that education, whether you are a president or you are a physician or you are a business person or you are an engineer or, or whatever, you know, it's the professors that impart that knowledge or help to shape that future. So I was just talking to somebody yesterday mm. and we have, were having a conversation how teachers don't get paid. Yes. You, me- you mentioned, you know, they don't get recognized. I also feel like they don't get paid as, that as is well true. as that they, is true. they deserve. They that is true. Be, yeah. That is true. How, how, how do you plan on, like, tackling your new role as far as dean of, you know, the university in Delaware? How do you, how do you plan to approach it, like... Well, like everything that I've, you know, you know how I've always approached things is, uh, is to first of all to understand uh, the the college. It's mm-hmm. going to be new for me. Mm-hmm. I've been a department head, mm-hmm. you know, not really been a dean before. But there is no school where you learn how to be a dean, <laughs> 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 you know. So um, I guess my approach is really going to be to get to learn, to get to know my faculty, to get to know my students. I'm already familiar a lot with working with students. I know the types of issues that arise with students. And so, um, and I'm I'm excited about it because I have some ideas on what we can do to move towards student success. Mm -hmm. That's my passion is student success, making sure that every student succeeds. I always say that students are diamonds in the rough, given a geologic analogy and like uh, a juror has to take the diamond that is cut it's rough when you first get it out of the earth it's very rough it's not shiny and you cut it and you polish it and it becomes you know it's shiny yeah. and so i feel like as educators that's our role is we take these students and with rough edges <laughs> and we bring out their full potential so i've always believed in bringing out the full potential in students and that um every student has a right to succeed and mm-hmm. our job is to make sure that they succeed so I look forward to some of those uh, challenges and mm. opportunities, actually. Lots of opportunities, I think. Um, and hopefully we can tap into some of the opportunities that exist. And mm. uh, But my first goal would be is to try to get to know the university better. Mm. Um, I can have ideas, but I need to understand the system there to know how to implement those ideas. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm-hmm. You you just came back from Malawi and like yes. here in stuck in the middle. One of one of the things we you know try to highlight is bridging that gap between you know the diaspora here mm-hmm. and back home wherever yes. that person is from yes. as far as an immigrant. Yes, and you've traveled uh, around the world a lot, yep. extensively. You know? yes. Extensively. Mm-hmm. Yes. So how yes. how how do you view twofold question? How do you view um, education here and different places that you've seen and how yes. like just advice on how can it can be done better as far as like we have this more like the West is better. Overall, how can, you know, the third world country like Cameroon or Malawi, for example, can emulate what the West is doing here? How do you see it differently done? Well, it is, you know, you have to travel through so many countries. Like, I have to really understand that we, we face a really big challenge in education in, uh, in developing countries, in Africa in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, facilities. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of my biggest frustrations when I was in Malawi this last trip is just internet mm-hmm. connectivity. Infrastructure. It was just crazy. So there's just no cyber infrastructure there. Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine how difficult it is. So I give a homework assignment to my students. They can just go on to Google and get information on journals, articles, or whatever it is. And uh, today our students don't even have to go to the library, right? You can just sit on your desk and you just get into the university library system. I want this journal article. And in one second, it's right there. Well, think about it. Uh, most of the universities in Africa don't have subscriptions to some of these journals. And so they're not current. Mm. You know, some of them may not be as current with recent research as the students here. So there's a big disparity that I've seen in some of the countries um, that, I've, that I've been to. Uh, but there's opportunity, especially for the diaspora. And that's why I've spent the last 17 years going back to Africa almost every summer. You guys know that. I'm always gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always gone. So, And it's just that desire to want to bring that new knowledge to them and help. Uh, when we go out, we engage not only students, we also engage faculty because some of these faculty also need uh, some refresher mm. courses or even just to we take uh, modern equipment, up-to-date equipment to them, you know, more advanced technology to them, and we teach them how to use the different instruments that we take with them. So, and one of the things that the students always tell me is, you know, we learn all these things in the classroom. It's all theoretical. And wow, we get to actually see it in real life. And that's really the advantage that the American system of education has Mm -hmm. is hands-on, right? I mean, we have labs and your labs are well equipped and you have everything in your labs, but that's not the way it is in many countries. So some of these students, all they do is like, they they can recite the textbook to you, but that's it. But in how this plays out in real life and mm-hmm. how do you take this knowledge and, 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 and use it to make informed decisions is very difficult because they don't have access to a lot of the kinds of instruments that we have, especially in the science, you know. I think in the social sciences and humanities, it may not be that bad, but in terms of the sciences, there's a huge disparity. And so, but I feel that there's a role that the diaspora have to play. And so I encourage my young faculty, for example, I say, take three-week trips. So when I go to different African countries, one of the things that I talk to them about is, uh, are you open to have short-term visits? Can you support short-term visits? Even if you can just provide accommodation for the U.S. scientists, they can come for three weeks. They can come for one month. You know, so that's important because we can help develop them as well. Yeah. Uh, here in Stunk in the Middle, um, we, like to <coughs> we like to pinpoint a point in time when you faced a lot of challenges, like Reflex said. Um, being that you're a woman in education, you've attained such, you know, you've attained a great height. Mm-hmm. You've been a lot of firsts. Yeah, you've been a lot of firsts. <laughs> and you definitely stepped on, you know, other people's toes, men, for example, who probably didn't um, think you were um, Qualified. equipped enough to, you know, hold such a position. How did you, you know, face those adversaries? Like, how did you address them? How mm-hmm. did you? you know, we always, uh, in, it's something that is becoming, that we are recognizing in academia more and more, is what we call implicit bias. And we say every person has their biases. Women have implicit bias, men have implicit bias. And there are studies that have clearly demonstrated that if uh, two people applied for a job, and one's name is John Doe, the other one is Jane Doe. John Doe, for exactly the same resume, gives, it gets the job or is seen as being better qualified than Jane Doe and gets paid more than Jane Doe. 
And then it's even worse being a black person. And that if you have um, like a Jane Doe and Shineka Doe, well, immediately if I say the word, the term, sh the name Shineka, I'm thinking that's a black person. Mm. And immediately you have a bias. So yes, they exist. Uh, but my goal in life has been to keep looking forward and be focused. Does bias exist? Yep. Have I been discriminated against? Yes. Have I faced implicit bias in my life all the time, even with students? You know, so it's very common for me to have students call me Estella. Now you are thinking, Auntie, they call you Estella? Yeah. <laughs> but they won't call my male colleagues by their first names. Mm. But they, they will call me by my first name. Even in the classroom, we find out that for student evaluations, studies do show that uh, women get poorer evaluations from students than their male colleagues and female black uh, faculty even get worse evaluation so being a, a female black person you're like at the bottom of the totem pole in almost anything you do so it's a huge barrier that you have to overcome but you gotta work hard you gotta stay focused and that's what i try to do and i ignore all of those things because sometimes the record speaks for itself and that's what i tell people if your record is there it speaks for itself even sometimes it is difficult for those biases to have the better you know uh, to to have control over your life and your destiny and so i i don't get caught in the little little do i get angry and annoyed <laughs> sometimes and I, of course i do but you know what i i have a goal and i set my eyes on those on those goals and that's what I do. Just tag on to that, like, as far as you know, you're a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. Women and young women who are coming up after you right now, how, who are, you know, into education and in other fields in life, how yes. they can, you know, follow in those school systems, even do better, you know, because in mm -hmm. life, you know, you yeah, said, you said, yeah. you said past and you want people behind you to do better. And yes, like do yes, excel, yes, yeah. yes. So how, what would be your advice as far as like, this is the path that they try to tread, that you've trailblazed, how, how, how should they tackle it in the coming? I mean, I really think that, um, for me, if you ask me that, what are some of the marks of success? I would say that if you could predict who will be successful, I would say that somebody who has a passion mm -hmm. for whatever they do, doesn't matter what it is mm -hmm. they're motivated they're hungry not hungry to make money or for food i'm talking about that hunger to want to make something better of their lives those are the people that i can tell you will succeed because with that hunger with that passion keeps your eyes on the goals and i always tell um, my students that uh, serendipity is planned luck there is no such thing as, oh, I was just lucky and they just gave me this job. Guess what? If there was a job advertised and you were standing right there with the uh, head of HR, if you didn't have the necessary skills, you're not going to get a job. Right. So that's what I mean by serendipity is planned luck. So one of the things, the message that I've been giving my students lately is serendipity is planned luck. You have to plan your luck. Things are not just going to happen. You have to plan it. You know, there are parents who, when they give birth to their children, they plan that those kids are going to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. So some of you think that you can just show up in high school and I'm going to apply and get into Harvard. <laughs> when there are people who've been planning for the last 18 years. So planning is very important. Um, one of my, the richest um, alumni of my university, Oklahoma State, Boone Pickens, always tells the students, that they have to plan. And he tells a story about his father, you know, when he just finished from Oklahoma State, calling him at the side and saying, Boone, uh, let me tell you something. He says, a fool with a plan is better than a genius without a plan. And he says, but son, the problem my mother and I have about you is that you are a fool without a plan. And so he has really always encouraged our department to have a plan for success and using those very simple principles we've been able to move our department really really far in the last you know four years that I've been a department head there and it's just because we took that advice uh, into consideration and so I've been telling you all you have to have a plan you know 
short-term plans? What's your five-year plan? What's your one-year plan? What's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? And then it's not just simply say, okay, here's my plan or here are my goals. Okay, have a plan, set your goals. And then you have to put, you have to attach metrics to those goals. How are you going to know that you've ac- accomplished those goals? Right? Okay. You just can have a plan. If you don't have a plan and you, you don't have a way of telling how you're going to accomplish that plan, then it's not a good plan. And so I always tell my students at the beginning of the semester, let's have a plan. What are the products? What do you want to accomplish at the end of the semester? Okay, now let's break them down into little tasks. Mm. You know, I come to my office every morning. If you come to my office, you see on my desk, you see little yellow sticky pads. And on it, I would have for the day the things that I must accomplish. So people are always amazed. Oh my God, you travel all the time, you're doing all of these things, and yet at the end of the day, you've published five, six, seven papers. How is that possible? Even as a department head, I was doing that because I always had a goal. I stuck them on my... It's a crude way of doing it, but it was effective. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, by the end, and because you know what happens? Uh, if you say, I have to accomplish this, make a list. I have to accomplish this by the end of the day. And then... In university city, there's a lot of chit-chatting that goes on. I mean, I come and sit in my office. Students want to see me. Some days I have meetings, 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 meetings until like 3 o'clock. I'm like, oh, I look at my goals. I've not accomplished any because I've been having meetings. You know what I do? I just close my door for two hours. I work on those things. And by the end of the day, I've accomplished it. But if I didn't have those goals, I just pick my bag and go home. And that happens one day, two days, a week, two weeks, a month, three months, and a year goes by, you haven't really done much. Because you didn't have a plan, you didn't have any goals, you didn't set your eyes on the goals. And to me, I have found that to be the most effective way of being able to accomplish a lot of things. Okay. And that's a really good tip. So if you don't have goals, you don't have plans, you better start having them. She dropping dimes, man. Yeah, <laughs> real <laughs> dimes. Yeah, we're just sitting here <laughs> just acquiring all this information, you know. We'll start like charging <laughs> you guys for this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have, I have yes. a question. Being yes. that we live in a nation that's a capitalist nation, yes, and most of the time, um, higher education is looking as a way of attaining that degree to be well off in the job market. Mm-hmm. What majors, being that you you're gonna be a dean and being that you're in academia, what majors at this current moment in time that we live in it would give you a real return on your investment? In terms of higher education. That's, that's a very, very interesting question. And that's a really good question for a dean. <laughs> 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 because you, wh- when we have parents visit the university, you know, and the first thing I'm going to ask is, uh, how much money are they going to make when they get out? When I went to school, we didn't ask those questions. We didn't care. We just wanted the education and that was it. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what we were thinking. But we just went to school. We had a degree. And then we'd, after that, oh, I got a degree. Now I got to look for a job. But it's all different with the millennials. You know, it's all different. So we have parents come to visit Mm -hmm. and uh, they want to know, is my, when I put in all this money in my son's or my daughter's education, are they going to be able to get a job? So that's why you see on university web pages, we like to say uh, we, universities can brag about, you know, return on investment in this major and that major and whatever it is. And so you can imagine that the humanities start thinking, oh my God, we're in trouble. And in reality, if you look at, um, I have typically been in a college of arts and sciences that uh, the arts and sciences have been seeing a significant decline in enrollments mm-hmm. nationwide. Some schools have even closed because parents perceive that if you have a degree in English, if you have a degree in history, you can do much with that. What we're trying to do is to re-educate parents um, that you can still do very well with a degree in history. There are lots of people with degrees in history and English that work on Wall Street. You may not know this. And so what we're trying to do now is to open minds of people. Yes, we try to do a good, a better job connecting uh, students, their careers to jobs. Um, We try to do that, but you know, as I say, you could go get a degree in engineering and still not be successful. You could get a degree in English mm-hmm. and be very successful. Yes, the STEM fields seem to have a much better return on investment. But as a dean, I don't want to sit here and say that it, do, it would be a bad idea to have your kid go do English. No, they could be a writer. 
they could be copy editors those people make a lot of money so again uh, we go back to planning what do you want to do with your life you know you could do you could do you know i i i tell i tell the faculty that we should not be teaching students for specific careers that we know there are careers in the future that we don't know we should be preparing students for tomorrow's problems not for yesterday's problems mm -hmm. and so when we teach to specific careers and specific things i think you know uh we may not be doing our students uh, a, a good service i am more for entrepreneurship and saying that we need to teach students to become entrepreneurs and i've always been encouraging you guys yeah. gotta start your own business yeah. you know mm -hmm. you never make money working for anybody you have to make money only when you work for yourself yeah. and so we need to be training the minds of the students to think about if you don't get a job then what's going to happen to you you should be able to create your own and I think that's the way we really need to educate the students for the future. Because mm -hmm. we don't know what the future uh, problems are going to be, right? Right. Yeah, we don't know what they're going to be. And so we need to prepare them for that future. Yeah. Uh, yes. Especially now. Now is a high time for entrepreneurship. Yes. Because things are gravely going downwards. Exactly. They're gone are the days where you get a degree and you feel like you've unlocked this world where you're yes. set for life. Yes. You, know, you never know in the future. Yes. Nowadays. And I think that's why a lot of black parents got caught up in... Uh, engineering, um, lawyer, lawyer doctor. and doctor. Mm -hmm. And I, when I speak to parents, I say, look, um, you send your, 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 your daughter does your science, whether it's geophysics or uh, geochemistry or geology, for example, and they finish school, they get into grad school, they're paid. They have a stipend, complete free. When we recruit students, we give them a stipend. You know, sometimes it's uh, $20,000 a year. Their tuition is completely paid for. And after two years, if they're lucky, they get a job with an oil, oil company. They're starting with a six-figure salary. So, and I tell the parents, I said, there are other opportunities other than going to limiting the, the kids to one particular profession. And that's mm -hmm. where we struggle in the geosciences to get diversity in the geosciences because... Um, a lot of um, underrepresented groups don't see it as a viable profession. But think about the oil industry and how much money people they make. You know, um, we have alumni from my at Oklahoma State that many of them, several of them are millionaires. Many of them are millionaires. You couldn't say that for a lot of you know doctors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the debt. <laughs> they don't have mm -hmm. the student debt. Mm -hmm. They don't have the hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars in debt. So we've been trying to educate parents that look, allow these kids to just be who they want to be, and uh, and they could be much more successful because success tomorrow is not going to be defined by success in terms of careers. Uh, it's not going to be defined by the way we define our own success. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then that leads into my next question. We just had a forum about mental health. Yes. Being that you're in academia, yes. what yes. have you seen with students that are thrust into a career or a major which they not they not passionate about but being that their parents want them to have that degree and have a certain job that's going to pay a certain amount and then they find difficulties like in in, in their academic works and then they they Stressed. start they they start falling uh, falling depressed yeah and whatnot yeah. you give us an like an example well it so the mental health issue is a, it's a very big thing, thing that we 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 face in academia with mm -hmm. students kids come uh, for a variety of reasons you know um and that's why we try to educate parents that look most parents think that they can they can relieve their lives through their children mm. I wanted to go to medical school I couldn't so you must go to medical school I wanted to be an accountant and I couldn't so you must become an accountant or Oh, the Joneses next door are accountants. See how well they're doing. And I, you know, it's it's a mistake for parents to do that. It doesn't mean that parents should not give advice mm -hmm. to their children. They should. Um, I mean, we we had we had that problem with our cousin Kyra. She went to Harvard, and when she was going to Harvard, she wanted to go to medical school. Well, she went there and she, for, she fell in love with performing arts. So you could imagine that for us. Like, are you kidding me? I'm paying all this money at Harvard for you to go <laughs> sing or do something. And, and, um, and she just had no more passion 
for her STEM courses. And she had gone to an academy that was all focused on science and math, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, and that's what she had done all her life. She just said she had no desire. And we kept forcing her like, no, you must do this, giving her the ultimatum and realize that she started aspiring into depression. And so we had a meeting with some folks at Harvard and they said, look, you cannot define the professions for your children. And we at Harvard train the students to be successful. It doesn't matter what their majors are. They will be successful because we train them to create opportunities for themselves, to become leaders. And so don't worry about it. I mean, it took a lot of talking for us to let her go because we were just like, no way, we're going to pull you out of school, can't send you to Harvard, and we have to be explaining to all the family members now that she's not going to medical school and blah, blah, blah. She's doing fine, right? Mm -hmm. She's doing fine. She finished and she's doing fine. Mm -hmm. And yes, it didn't matter. But sometimes it is hard. Yes, and I do understand that, that uh, parents are very, very anxious about the future of their children and especially migrant parents. Mm -hmm. I think the American parents have learned how to let go. But us, first generation immigrant parents, mm -hmm. we can be tiger moms, you know, and it becomes really, really hard for us to let the children go and follow their passions. I like what you guys are doing, okay? No school curriculum is teaching you guys this, but you have a passion and you're gonna make a difference. And that's all we want is for the students uh, the young generation to make a difference in the world in which they live in that's that's basically what we want them to be so i mean being that <clears throat> you know you're the um dean of you know university um in this in this in this era mm -hmm. you know most um uh, most kids by age our age they don't really view the whole get a degree as you know standard anymore because they all this vocational you know um things popping up everywhere um dba cyber security and all why not what's your thought um what's your thought on that well that's a it's that's again that's a very very interesting question you know um can you be successful not having a degree yes but what are the likely chances of success not having a degree i uh, studies all show that people who have a bachelor's degree overall in life do better than people who don't have a bachelor's degree. People who have a graduate education also do better than people who don't do graduate education. So yes, while it may look like uh, I could just go do this and all I need to do is just uh, six months or something or one year or two years and I can make money. But is that really the whole goal in life? I mean, do we define success in just about money that we make? I think there's an importance of having education because education is not, we are not educating you just so you could go get a job, but we're educating you so you can become a mean, uh, somebody who impacts their society in a meaningful way. And I really feel that to be able to do that, education plays an important role in that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say, you know. Uh, is vocational school not good oh there's a place for education for vocational programs and they are not everybody can go to college not everybody wants to go to college mm. um but i do believe that higher education is plays a very very important role think about the advancements that we have in technology in our society from medical advancements to uh, exploration f in mars how are you going to do that if you don't if you don't have a degree is that even possible? Mm -hmm. It's not possible. Right. So there is a place for, for a lot of the advancements, the technological advancements that we see come from education. I want to ask you, like, just, you know, how do you travel just for fun sometimes? <laughs> what do you find? Do you they find time it, for fun? Uh, somebody called it what? What is it? Business and pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Is that what they call it? Or something <laughs> yeah. like you blend them together. Mm, business and pleasure. So what I do when what I travel. Yeah, what do you do for pleasure? Like, what you know? I do for <laughs> pleasure. I'm always working, always traveling. <laughs> um, I like, I like reading a lot. And so when I travel, I read a lot, actually. That's when I actually do have the time to read. Mm -hmm. When I'm at home, in the evenings or early in the mornings, I like to go running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like doing that. And um, so that's what I do. But even when I travel, 
I find the time to take a, a break. Mm-hmm. And so in between my trips, I take a take a couple of days, three, four days for a safari. Even when we take the students abroad, that's what we do. Uh, we work them really, really hard, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. in the evening. And then the weekends, we take them on a safari trip and it's, everything is worth it, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, so we do that. And uh, I I love visiting my family, just having time, you know, with, with family. And that's uh, how we're able to catch you today. No? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Speaking of speaking of home and travel, right? Yes. I'm about to ask you a really, really intense question. Okay. You could choose to answer or not. Mm-hmm. But these days, yes. most men, for example, yep. they would not. They can't see themselves, you know, having a, a wife that travels a lot. They, they, they just want to see their wives around them constantly. They can't really feather that travel, mm-hmm. travel thing. How have you been able to, you know, manage family, travel, and your own personal desires? <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's a, 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 a real delicate balance. You'll have to ask uncle <laughs> <laughs> about that, that. How can he let me uh, go all over the world and let him stay at home most of the time? And that is why even though both of, both of us are in academia, mm-hmm. he stays home most of the time, especially when the kids are younger. Somebody has to be there for the children. You can't just take off. I didn't travel this much when the kids were younger because I knew that they needed me. But ever since they went to college, I have more wings to fly mm-hmm. because now they're older and they've left their home. There's nobody at home just you know, just mm-hmm. the two of us, so and I can travel a whole lot you, more. You guys are what we now. call power couple. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking so there are times that he goes, I stay home, I go, he stays home, mm-hmm. you know, so I do most of the traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, so he stays home and takes takes care mm-hmm. takes care of the uh, kids and the family. And uh, But it's a balance. Okay. And the couples need to understand each other. When you have two dual career couples, they have to understand each other. We've been very, very supportive of each other's career. And I would say he's been extremely, being an African man, <laughs> much more supportive of my career than I think most men can be. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's, he's very proud of my accomplishments. And he doesn't think that it, 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 he's any, it makes him any less. And he always reminds people, you know, behind every strong woman, there's an even stronger man. <laughs> 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 you know, so, and that's the way he feels. And I, I think yeah. a lot of young men need to take that example from him, mm-hmm. you know, um, because he always makes a joke that I married you because I knew that my children were going to survive if I died. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very true. Yeah, it's very true. It's very, it's true. very true. And most men should not be intimidated by strong women. Tell me which woman in your family is not strong. Do you know of That's anyone? Facts. No. Yes, we I come know. from a Shout family of very mom. strong women. <laughs> really? <laughs> very, very strong all women. Moms. If I start listening in now, exactly, I forget some names. Right? Some it's yeah. very, very <laughs> strong women. And that is good. That's a very good thing. Right. But you also know that you have a lot of strong women in the family, but there are also traditional women, right? Mm-hmm. Where they respect uh, the, the husbands and they don't disrespect the husband just because they're much more assertive and much more uh, ambitious. There's nothing wrong with ambition. It's a good thing to have ambition. But at the same time, you have to temper that with humility. And that's basically what I've done. You know, I don't go around announcing to people that I have so many degrees or so many accolades. Mm -hmm. Um, You guys probably will not even know unless you Googled me. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yes. You you spoke about um, reading. What what books can you recommend for like our young adult um, listeners? Well, I mean, I the books that I motivational books are are of course very good. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, most of the books that I read are just for pleasure. I love John Grisham. Don't ask me why, but I do. I buy. I've bought every single one of his books. And there's a recent book out now by Young Cameroon. Uh, in Bolo Mboe. Um, yes, I just bought the book in South Africa. Yes, I bought a book in South Africa. I haven't finished reading it yet, so I'm looking forward to reading that book. So I just read a lot of books for, 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 for pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would love to have a conversation with you when you're done reading that book. <laughs> you know, I had so many questions for the writer, but. Uh-huh. You know, I'm definitely Maybe we can get her on here. Maybe you can get her <laughs> on here, right? And then she'll be able to, to talk She's to you. Opera status. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yeah, yeah you can send her a message on Facebook, you know. And yeah, we send her a link to yeah, we, we, we've reached out to her publicists and managers, you know. These things take time, but it know. takes time, yeah. you know. Yeah, but I'm for sure me, she's flooded with a whole yeah. lot all of requests. kinds of things, right. yeah. But if they see that you're trying to make a difference in the lives of young people, mm-hmm. then that's you know, I I, I, again, it always depends on when people have wanted my time, I've given the time, especially if I feel that it's to empower the young generation, uh, I do. I'll Mm -hmm. take the time out, you know, to talk to them, explain things to them. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on people's passions and what they want out of life, yes. So when you sit and reflect Mm -hmm. back on things and think of what you're about to accomplish, I mean, the the things you're about to, you know, do more, is it right for me to say that you could see um, um, yourself and your mother or your mother and you? <laughs> uh, you have to ask my uncle that. <laughs> 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 yes, I think so. I really think that a lot of who I have become, it's, it's, I'm almost evolving into her. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, you know. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> yes, it's not because she was a wonderful person. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, great person. Yes, yeah. Yeah. a great, great person. I mean, believe so much in family, believe in empowering everybody in the family, mm-hmm. that together as a family, we can grow together as that's opposed facts. to building silos. Mm, yeah. You know, yes. She and that, and that's going to ripple down, you know, like your, your, your offspring. And yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. It is is there something that um, you haven't accomplished yet that you want to accomplish? Mm. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to continue to um, make a difference in the lives of the young generation. And I always say the younger people, because to be really honest with you, I look at my life today, I'm like, uh, been there, done that. Mm. Um, but the future belongs to the young people. And therefore, my goal is to help prepare them so that they can tackle that future. So I'm going to continue, continue, continue always to to want to work in empowering the younger generation, you know, so that they can also achieve even better than I have achieved. What yeah. a pro- what a, no, no better profession than the one you're in right now. I'm yes, telling you, man. that's why, you know, I love my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know sometimes I sit and I ask myself, you know, we, we uh, this is a really interesting question because I was in Malawi, I do a lot of field work, and it requires I, I get so dirty mm-hmm. out in the dirt, you know, dragging big heavy cables and for the instruments that we put to try to image the subsurface, you know. And this guy looks at me and says, why didn't you just become a medical doctor? Why are you doing all of this? <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked at him and said, I really love what I do. You know, it's so exciting to me to be out there teaching my students that this is how you do it and having challenges and using my my vast experience in overcoming some of those challenges in the field. They're like, how do you know all of these things? I say, when you've been doing this amount of work for 27 years like I have been, then you have, you know, all the tricks Mm -hmm. in the book on how to overcome some of the challenges, you know, when you're out there. And you see the look on their faces, how mesmerized they are and how appreciative they are and how they feel like, oh, wow, I'm so lucky to be working with this person. That's what gives me satisfaction at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. I hope anybody that's listening to this probably going to say, oh, you know what? I want to go to the school where she's a dean. At. Because for me, um, I go to UMBC and... Arbosky, he did it for me because one night I was watching 60 Minute and he came on like he spoke about his students with so much passion mm-hmm. and they interview him walking on campus and he would stop talk to students. I was like, wow, that guy's great. I want to go to that school wherever yes, it is. I yes, want to go there yes. and find that was just in the backyard. So I was like, I'm definitely going to go there. So, yeah, I mean, if you have dinner with him one one night, I'm sure you guys will probably cross paths at some point. Tell yes. Him I say hi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was waiting for you to land. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, and I hope those listening, you do consider University of Delaware. Okay. I'm already putting a plug for University. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I didn't wear in blue today. I'm a blue hen. <laughs> oh, that's the, that's a mask of blue hen. No, yes, yeah, a blue hen. Yeah. It's, it's so I'm, I'm trading so? a cow girl for a, an blue. orange cow girl for a blue hen. Oh wow! <laughs> Orange cow girl. Which uh, mascot was that? Uh, Oklahoma State. Oh, oh yeah, 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 the cowboys. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So Auntie. I'm, yes. Good things was coming to my end. Why now? Uh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, appreciate you. You know, giving us all this wisdom and you know being patient enough for us to set up and have this podcast. It's great. You're gonna come back, right? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Coming back. You want to wrap us up? Next man. time you bring uncle, he can give you yeah. his own. Yes. 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 Definitely. yes, definitely. I wanted to focus definitely. on you because, yeah, like like yes. I said before, this, yes. this is like full circle. Yeah, onion. We're just trying to yeah. unpack you. Then yeah. Next time, yeah, uncle. Definitely. Yeah, uncle is he, he's, he's hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's really yeah, he, he just shows up and then you it turn around, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, um, it's been it's been a pleasure to have you know auntie come you know pour some knowledge on us and you know on you too um don't forget you know to visit lucky like dot com l e k e l i k e dot com did i say it right mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 you know to go you know stuck in the middle merch yeah you know we got you know some awesome colors you know t-shirts and stuff stuck in the middle you know join the movement support the movement mm -hmm. um and if you if you listen and you got you know like uh, younger f uh, siblings, and you know they thinking about colleges, they live in the DMV area, definitely uh, Delaware State, yeah. Delaware University. You know, so yeah, Delaware. Yes, and, uh, yeah. yes. Got a dean sitting right here. You know, gonna make sure she's straight and right, and you know, so <laughs> <laughs> so the right courses, plugging you know the financially and everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. See, I, I'm not sure she's going be stuck in the office you know at the top <laughs> floor and just be there all day you know she's gonna interact and yeah. find out yeah. what's going on yes yeah. Definitely. Yeah. definitely thank you so much even for out this, of state uh, too out of state yeah <laughs> thank you guys for this opportunity it's been a pleasure really speaking to you and i like what you guys are doing and I'm, thank you i'm hoping that for your listeners that uh you're doing a great job and i'm proud of all of you thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you thank you really appreciate Dude, um how can how can people reach you on social media <laughs> Social media, right? Yes, yeah. I am. I am on Twitter. I think it's at Equina E on uh, Twitter, and I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, I still have my website at Oklahoma State, which is going to probably be dismantled. But I'm going to have a new one at University of Delaware beginning September first. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. If you have any educational advice, I mean, you problem, could always Google me. Exactly. <laughs> Here, uh, she would not. She would not you know, shut you down because she's open, you know, to yes. work with serious people, by the way, serious people. Don't <laughs> come with no, no funny business. <laughs> but yeah, we're stuck in the middle. And I'm Sir Hans and we out. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs>